Good evening, everybody. My name is David Mills, uh, and welcome to the Mayor Brown Global Diversity Month event. This is My America, uh, Kimberly Johnson on advocacy through diverse storytelling. Uh, my name is David Mills. I'm an associate in the Banking and Finance Group uh, at Mayor Brown here in the Washington, D.C. office. Uh, I uh, moderated the Black History Month book club uh, event last month where we discussed The Some of Us by Heather McGee. And I guess I must have done an okay job because I was invited back uh, to do this one. So I'm very grateful to have this opportunity. Uh, I'm going to just read a little bit of the um, description of the event. So I guess everyone can make sure that they're in the right spot. Uh, we are here with Kimberly Johnson to discuss her novel, This Is My America. Uh, our conversation will cover topics such as diverse storytelling, advocacy for criminal justice reform, and the rising phenomenon of diverse educational curriculums and stories being banned, challenged, or removed from school districts across the country. Uh, Kim Johnson is the author of the award-winning young adult thriller, This Is My America. The best-selling novel explores the generational effects of racism on families and calls for reform of the policing and prison industry all through the lens of a teenage girl. Uh, the rights of the book have been acquired for adaptation into television um, by HBO Max and her upcoming novel, Invisible Sun, will be released in June. A uh, little bit of housekeeping. Uh, for those who are um, attending virtually, uh, there'll be a Q&A, well, for everyone, there'll be a Q&A session of about 10 minutes at the end. And for those attending virtually, you can submit your questions uh, through the Q&A function uh, through Zoom. Uh, I'm just going to, oh, and also, I guess, for those of you here in DC, as you can tell, there's uh, be a cocktail reception uh, afterwards for about an hour. So I'm going to read a description of the book, just so uh, for those who haven't had a chance to read it or haven't read the description recently, that you're kind of up to speed on the contents of the book. So here we go. Every week, 17-year-old Tracy Beaumont writes letters to Innocence X, asking the organization to help her father, an innocent Black man on death row. After seven years, Tracy is running out of time. Her dad has only 267 days left. Then the unthinkable happens. The police arrive in the night and Tracy's older brother, Jamal, goes from being a bright, promising track star to a quote unquote thug on the run, accused of killing a white girl. Determined to save her brother, Tracy investigates what really happened between Jamal and Angela down at the pike, but will Tracy and her family survive the uncovering of the skeletons of their Texas town's racist history that still haunt the present. Um, so I really enjoyed this book. I told Kim that before we got into the questions, I was just gonna run through the reasons that I like this book uh, so much. Uh, first off, um, it's fiction and a murder mystery. And for those of you who are more into nonfiction, um, nonfiction, you kind of know how the story ends. You're just getting a better idea of how things, like why things happen the way they happen. And it was very nice to kind of not know how things ended. It kind of like pulled me along. I really liked that the protagonist, the protagonist was a strong young black female lead, also a uh, civil rights activist slash detective. Uh, I feel like young black female protagonists are probably uh, pretty underrepresented in the world of fiction. So I was pleased to see that and we'll be setting this book aside for my, both of my children, but especially my daughter. Uh, I liked for teens that it covered dating and romance and kind of show the kind of awkward phase that everyone goes through as they transition um, through puberty. It also covers interracial dating, which of course is getting, is more and more popular in our society. Uh, it covers class, class issues, um, such as Angela talking about her, how fabulous her weekends are, and Dean's parents owning the company that Tracy's mom works. Uh, for those of you who like audiobooks. The narrator is fantastic. Her name, was Bon her name is Bonnie Turpin. Uh, just to give you an idea of how awesome she is, uh, in 2018, Audible inducted her into the Narrator Hall of Fame. And I was like 20 minutes into this book before it hit me that it was one person <laughs> doing all these voices. Uh, I really enjoyed the focus on civil rights and the criminal justice system. And I, I'm happy that teens have a book that shows them how important the media is and the portrayal of the events in their lives uh, and how much they can how much the media can sway um, people's opinions about different matters and i also really enjoyed the nods to the wire for those of you who have not seen the show the wire it is fantastic um, and the wire also like this book 
kind of looks at the interplay of police, uh, students, and the media. So uh, we'll start off with an uh, introductory question, which I'm sure you get all the time, which is how did you come up with the idea for this book? Yeah, well, thank you um, so much. And you, you like our interactions have been so great. And it's like clear that you should definitely be leading every kind of book club. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I would <laughs> love you to. do a thorough read. It's so wonderful to be here at Mayor Brown um, and to talk with you all here in person and virtually. And one thing that I always like to start to talk about um, because I've been to so many book talks before my book was published, and I always had this assumption about what a writer is and how long a writer has been. And my story is different. Um, and, and oftentimes writers always have side gigs, like they have a thing that they do. My side gig is I'm a vice provost at the University of Oregon, which is not much of a side gig, it's a full gig <laughs> that keeps me really busy. And I worked in higher ed for the past 20 years. And most of my work has been around access and student success and working with first gen underrepresented students, especially to ensure that they are successful. And throughout my time in that work, I was always around young people who were just starting the, starting the world. Um, they you know, had high hopes and dreams. Um, they hadn't been jaded like many, many of us have now been jaded by society. And I found that as I was talking with them about their dreams and their hopes, that there was, I it felt like I still had other things that I wanted to explore. And so I started writing, like my first creative concept of anything was writing the first draft of a novel at 32 years old. And it was something that I was never saw myself as a writer. Um, I was an administrator, I was a problem solver, I was a communicator, I was all of these things. But when you would ask me to write something, it would be like that dread inside. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna remember what a verb is and an adjective and all these things that I thought that like writing was. Um, and so when I started my journey as a writer, I was still trying to figure out my voice. And I knew that I wanted to write young adult because um, the way that my work was and how busy my work was, I found that reading young adult was a great escape for me. It felt like I could escape to my inner child and I could explore all these different kinds of things. Um, and I've always just been really connected to young People. That's why I've chosen to have a career in higher ed. Um, but it wasn't until 2015 when I had already written two other books that weren't going anywhere. I didn't have an agent. You know, I was still trying to like have this be my dream. And um, the Black Lives Matter movement started. And a lot of my students, especially um, my, my work that I do where I live was in Oregon and it's a majority white state majority white institution. And so oftentimes students of color, black students in particular, um, would look at um, the very few staff of color and faculty of color for support networks. And so I found myself because of the work that I was doing, because of my early stages as a young person doing activist work and organizing, I was often giving them input and feedback and um, not that they needed it because most of the time, they would go a totally different direction, which is like, which is great because they should be doing different things than I think like my generation and the generation before me did um, to make change. And um, what I found that the conversation was uh, of um, during the Black Lives Matter movement was really on um, a lot of police brutality. Like that was the focus. How can we stop police brutality? Why is it happening? And it was the same conversation that I had when I was in middle school and I saw footage of Rodney King being beaten in LA. And it's the same conversation that people had with previous generations before them. And, um, but it felt like that it was like the first time for many of the students, especially where I'm situated in Oregon, it's, it's you know, there's a, there's a, um, there's a lot of racial constructs and other things that I think are, are challenging for young people to have access to and to have conversations. And so oftentimes things that were on the news are the first time that they're seeing things in a systemic way that maybe they feel like their society and their environment operates in a certain way, but when they look at it systematically, they're seeing things a little bit differently and they didn't understand. And I wanted to, I realized that my writing, the things that I was passionate about, I read a lot of nonfiction. Um, I read just as much nonfiction and history, African-American history as I do young adult books. It's like sort of a, like an equal, you know, um, measure. And um, I realized that the kinds of things that I could write are what I call, which I, I stole the term from Jordan Peele and sort of like switched it a little bit, is social justice thrillers. Um, stories that talk about issues that are happening in society, breaking them down in different ways that are really approachable, but having them have a lens of a young person that can sort of 
drive into the story and, and feel sort of excited about what's happening and a deeper understanding. And so a lot of that came from um, working with my students and, and realizing that they were so focused on one aspect of, um, you know, issues of race in our country and not the systemic nature of it, the history of it, how it's sort of threaded, how the law works, how justice works, um, that, you know, we can focus on this sort of narrow window of police brutality, or we can look at, okay, what is happening in our community? What is happening when someone, you know, is arrested with no issues? They're, you know, they're arrested without harm. Um, what does their, um, you know, legal support look like? What does a community support look like? What does the, the court actually look like? What does their sentencing look like? And sort of threading that in the story. And, um, and that's really how I, how I sort of started and thought about my work. Nice. Um, I know the book kind of covers a lot of different places. We have kind of the police and their inner workings and got courts and you've got the prisons as well. And I was just curious, uh, how did you go about researching and kind of coming up with the background knowledge that you use to, to put all these words to paper? Yeah, I mean, I love re using research as part of my work. I think it's, I'm in an academic environment all the time. So I'm around, I'm around faculty, I'm in faculty meetings all the time. And so I have access to you know, lots of resources and oftentimes in writing, that was like my escape. Like mm -hmm. I should be writing, no, let me read, let me read this book. Um, but, you know, I've always been interested in law. Um, it was something like as a younger person, I wanted to go to law school. I wanted to sort of study, you know, um, you know, civil rights and justice and other kinds of things. And just had a real a fascination with the law and how the law works and, and in some ways doesn't work. Um, and so um, I, you know, I probably have about a hundred sources that I used in terms of looking at um, my work and writing my work. And that's anywhere from, from novels to um, podcast interviews to stories about um, people who have been wrongfully incarcerated and in their journey towards being exonerated, which often, you know, the reality is often takes decades um, for that to occur. And, um, and then, you know, real cases, case studies, um, Kawaja connected me to um, a colleague of hers um, who, you know, worked on wrongful death cases, worked very closely with Brian Stevenson when they were an associate intern. Um, and so to really trying to learn a little bit about the work that, that, you know, they did. And is this a real thing? How would this happen? And, you know, I probably have about 50 pages in my novel that when I, um, sent my full novel to my editor they're like this is so interesting and teens are not going to care <laughs> the legal workings of it so like like keep it snippy and keep it going but um you know that really sort of helped me at least you know work my way through the story and then using my own liberty of, of how to write it because i you know I, I i sort of resolve the the case and situation in the way that you can in in a young adult novel mm -hmm. um and not going over decades because i need to be in the lifespan of a of a, of a teen at the time so. right <clears throat> for those of you who don't know who brian stevenson is i just got a little bit of his bio uh, brian stevenson is an american lawyer social justice activist law professor at nyu law and founder and executive director of the Equal Justice Initiative. Based in Montgomery, Alabama, he has challenged bias against poor and minorities in the criminal justice system, especially children. He has helped achieve, uh, he has helped achieve United States court decisions that prohibit sentencing children under 18 to death or life imprisonment without parole. He has assisted in cases that have saved dozens of prisoners from the death penalty, advocated for the poor, and developed community-based reform litigation aimed at improving the administration of criminal justice. I think he was played in a movie mm -hmm. as well, Just Mercy. Yeah. Yeah, that was a great movie too. So check it out if you, ha if you haven't. Um, okay, now on to diverse storytelling. I loved Tracy, the protagonist. I hope to raise a Tracy. Um, so I just wanted to ask, uh, are there elements of Tracy that you see in yourself? Was she like maybe a combination of people that you knew growing up or people that you know now? Yeah, so Tracy's the main character in the story um, who had been writing, you know, letters for seven years to Innocence X, which is sort of my, my sort of um, homage to the Equal Justice Initiative and the Innocence Project. And um, throughout the novel, she is dogged, she's determined, she doesn't take no, um, 
for any reason. Um, and sometimes she does that in harmful ways. And part of the story of writing these you know, little story is that the sort the, the like um, understanding that and learning from that and growing from that. Um, and that is modeled, I would say, in two ways. My part young person at me as someone who had a lot of questions and um, didn't understand and um, was felt like if there was an issue in my community that I wanted to be someone who was at the table talking about them, supporting, being an ally mm -hmm. um, to, to people in my community. Um, and so part of that is me, but it's like ramped times three yeah. <laughs> because I, I really was thinking about um, radical acts of um, creating justice and creating justice for yourself and through protests, through sit-ins that a lot of my students were engaged in and thinking about the ones that um, often people didn't understand. Like, you know, they would go to... Um, uh, meeting with a student to sort of try to like engage in a in discussion of activism and the student wasn't satisfied with the way an administrator was interacting with them and I felt like that was really symbolic of a Tracy uh, because those are the students who are civil rights leaders those are the, this, the, the, the young people who are you know making change because you're um, put in a situation that's uncomfortable and that's the way that you can sort of make a resolution and so a lot of a lot of her is that and I guess the last thing in terms of her is um, that you mentioned in the intro is uh, you know as a young person there weren't a lot of books that had black characters in them and definitely not written by a, a black author and so i found myself loving i loved literature i loved reading but all the way up through high school i actually never read a past until until the age of 18 i never read a book by a black author that had black characters in it mm -hmm. um and it, so that wasn't until i hit college um and what does that do to a young person um, who was in a community that actually isn't represented? And, and so that's why I'm so passionate about writing for young people because of the gaps that I um, had experienced. Uh, but also the reason why I like to write stories with thrillers is because, you know, me loving literature, I couldn't necessarily see myself um, and the experiences in the story. And so um, reading a thriller or a mystery, I could be the detective. Like I might not have the lived experience of the people in the story. There might be things that I connect to. I think that that's actually built my empathy reading really widely, even if I didn't have books that read, had my representation. Um, but being able to problem solve and be a detective. And, and I've just, you know, all of my stories, there's some kind of element of that because I think it's, it was my first love of reading um, in that way. So Great. <clears throat> One of the things I also really appreciated about the book, especially for younger readers whose views on the world may not be as kind of firm as when you get when you get older. Uh, I love that there were perspectives from different perspectives from multiple people. So you had Tracy, you had her white friend Dean, who was also in high school with her. You had the views of the white sheriff in town. You had the views of Beverly, who was a black woman, female off a black woman officer. You had Dean's parents who seemed like they kind of are the, from the more conservative crowd. And kind of no matter who you are reading this book, I feel like there was someone in the book that you could say, oh, that person is, you know, expressing a view that I'm leaning towards and kind of see the interplay of the other characters' reactions and their viewpoints to what that person has to say. And my question is, when you started writing, were you kind of more thinking, I have this character, Tracy, I want to share her views because her views aren't really expressed very often in like uh, fiction, fiction setting, especially for teens to consume. Or were you thinking, I want to create a world where all of these views get to come together and the reader kind of gets to see how they all uh, interplay with each other? Yeah, you know, again, when I was starting to think about this novel and what I wanted to write and sort of like, thinking about, I've got to write something that really touches the core of this. That's, that's like 2015, but actually really starting to write in 2017. Um, and, you know, the world just seems so polarizing. Still seems very polarizing. Um, <laughs> things just seem so polarizing. You're either this or you're that. You're for this or against that. And, um, you know, to me, the I really wanted to write a novel that like actually showed my reality of how things are. Things are not just one way. 
And um, people only have their own lived experiences. And so if I have my lived experience and you have it and someone else has it, we're all interacting together. And how do you actually craft that in a novel that shows the thread of, of how communities raise the people in their community? How do teachers interact with students and the diversity of that? Um, you know, the parents, how they raise their children and their, their views and where their views come and then what, where, how their kids sort of differ or agree with them or sit with the uncomfortability of, um, for example, Dean in the story, um, who is a, you know, loves Tracy in the story, like love interest here going on. And, um, and you know, but like has misunderstandings and says things that are, you know, you know, biased, you know, and how does he sit with that? And how does Tracy, you know, you know, sit with that and let him be on his own to kind of figure it out. And, and I felt like that was something that we weren't really seeing um, as much. And I really wanted that to be in the novel. And, and, and I also, you know, when I was, so my, my book was released in 2020, July of 2020, um, right after the, you know, things shut down in March, as we all remember. Oh God. And, um, and the, the book world didn't quite know what are we going to do with books like like everything shut down, we're not doing events and we're not doing all these other kinds of things. And it was also at a time that, you know, people were still protesting and were heavily, you know, engaged in, um, you know, after the deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery. And, um, you know, a lot of the conversations that are happening now in thinking about um, abolition and what should, what, what should we do about police and police brutality, you know, my book was sort of written before a lot of those conversations were um, in common vernacular, in, in sort of like common knowledge of like, you know, where should we put our investments um, when we're trying to think about resolving these kinds of issues. And, um, and so I really wanted to show the diversity of policing because for me, it would be, it would be too, ob too obvious and almost too simple to think about, you know, I want to address an issue of police brutality, so I'm going to make all the police bad. <laughs> you know, like, 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 I can do that, and that's done, and, and, and that's, you know, fine. But if, my, if what I'm trying to do is approach and have a window to people is to show the diversity of that. And to show the tensions in that, in those experiences. And so um, what does it mean to be a black officer um, in a community where your father was actually accused and, and murdered, you know, which is the aspect that happened in my story. And so um, I really wanted to have a broad array of characters so that anyone can yeah. read it. And, and I have like, I have senior community centers that email me and say, we wrote your book as a book, you know, and it's like, it's this reach that I didn't actually never, I never, I never thought like an 80 year old, yeah. you know, woman is rallying a, her community center, you know, to read my work. And I think part of that is um, because I show the different aspects of, of characters that, that could be a window for them to sort of step into without being so defensive, I think, reading it. Nice. Okay, this next question uh, is getting kind of into the criminal justice reform portion. So uh, I stated in when I read the kind of the bio for the book, um, Tracy's dad is on death row. And I just have a few, a few thoughts before I dive into this question. Uh, one of the comments from the book that struck me was when Tracy says, why do they call it sitting on death row? You know, and I thought people that put people to death must have came up with that verb sitting because no one's just like sitting on death row. People are suffering on death row. People are languishing on death row. And sitting is almost like making it like they're kind of sitting on the dock of the bay, you know, <laughs> watching the tides roll away. And I just, so I started looking up some stats to see, I was curious if other countries that also have the death penalty um, use words like sitting to try to minimize it. Um, I didn't find, find any words like that. Uh, but I did see that out of all the Western countries, the United States is the only one that still has the death penalty. Um, I believe about it's about 60% of the countries uh, in the world uh, have abolished the death penalty. Um, the part about no human touch and uh, prison recently allowing prisoners to touch their loved ones and human touch is such a, like a basic need, you know, like I think if like, I remember when I, my kids were first born, they were like, take your shirt off, like human touch, like get that baby on you. And um, it was just sad to think that prisoners when their loved ones do come to visit would be even for, for, for a long period of time were even denied the opportunity to touch their loved ones like as their lives were, were winding down. 
So black Americans are about 11% of the population of the country, but make up 40% of the inmates on death row. Uh, when I think about capital punishment, I can't help but think about its uh, cousin, or I guess maybe even a sibling, just lynchings of black Americans in the United States of America. And I remember reading uh, Isabel Wilkerson's The Warmth of Other Sons, and there's just a, 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 a stat and a passage from there that has always struck me. Um, and the stat was every, but this is from 1915 to 1970. Every four days, somewhere in the South, an African-American lost his or her life, usually his life, over some presumed breach of the caste system. There were people who lost their lives for the accusation of having stolen 50 cents. There are people who lost their lives for having stolen a hog. The more common reason for lynching was the amorphous accusation of acting like a white person. And that's every four days for decades. And it just kind of, you know, is another example of the longstanding history in this country of black lives not being valued. And so my question is with the documented biases against black people in the criminal legal system, should there even be a death penalty? So not so much as in is the death penalty right or wrong, but if we know that, uh, that in this society, such a large portion of the citizenry, 40 million people are not gonna get a fair shake, should the death penalty just be done away with until the criminal legal system can show that its poorest and most marginalized groups can get uh, equal treatment. Uh, in in the courts, yeah, you know, I've um, I've studied the death penalty a lot, um, especially as I was writing this novel, and I I feel like it's a hard that's a hard question for me to answer to say what's the solution because I think you know it's a, it's one of those that like if you say yay or nay it's like okay then what's the solution and um, I think the most important thing is to look at the hard facts that you that you know you shared if one in nine people are exonerated. Um, is it is death penalty actually the right thing to do? Um, and I, I selected having the core of the story to be around wrongful incarcerations and the death penalty as a way to say, if we can get, if one in nine people are exonerated, um, then there's likely more people, right? So maybe it's one in eight people actually are innocent, Wh whatever the number is that you want to say. Um, if we're getting that wrong, what else are we getting wrong in the system? Mm -hmm. and if we're getting these things wrong in the system, how should we look at the system? Um, if we are looking at rates of sentencing and there's disparities in sentencing. So if we look at um, um, you know, um, mandatory sentencing that happens at a federal level, if you look at data that says that 75% of black people um, receive um, the highest mandatory sentencing compared to white people for the same crime, um, we should look at that, right? Um, if we're looking at, you know, 95% of prosecutors are white, if we're looking at um, juries and systems, if we're looking at um, rates of, uh, of equal cases, um, if we're looking at plea bargains that 95% of federal um, uh, uh, cases or felony cases have plea bargains and looking at breaking down the issue, there's, some, there's something going on here, right? And so if there's something going on here, I think we have to really look at, should we even, should we, should we have the death penalty? And I, and I think that there's so much more to look at and um, in understanding issues within our, our criminal justice system and, and how, to, um, how to resolve it, how to, how to fix it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think that we would be remiss to not look at how did the death penalty, how did, how did prisons get here? Mm -hmm. um i i you should read, if you have not read brian stevenson or if you've not seen a ted talk from brian stevenson you must it is it, you know it is a must to me he's like you know um his level of humanity and kindness is like times 20 what i could ever be <laughs> um and um but i think it, it's it's a way to really sort of understand and create um, take away your own beliefs and, and have another perspective and to think about that particular perspective. And, you know, he really talks about, you know, slavery didn't end. Um, it just evolved. And if we look at um, 
policing, where policing came from. If you look at our prison system and how we utilize our prison system and prisoners and how there's incentives to have more prisoners, especially in the, um, uh, the for-profit industry, that there are other systems that are influencing that. And we have to really look at all of those things. And so that's my way of really avoiding answering the question. <laughs> Yeah. Have, definitely, I, I feel like I don't, I, I, you know, I, the work that I do, it's more about not being me being an expert, but me pushing conversations that I think should be happening. Got it. That makes perfect sense. Um, so I looked at my clock, it's 610. Um, we do want to leave some time for Q&A. So I think we're going to move from the criminal justice section to the banned book section and do one question here. And then open it up for people who have questions or people online who want to submit questions. Um, so we'll do this question and then go to the, the Q&A. Uh, okay, so banned books across the country. So one of the, uh, I think it might have been one of the chapters in the book was named, was called Ruby Bridges Brave. And for those of you who don't know, Ruby Bridges, uh, when she was six years old, a uh, black girl integrated the William France Elementary School, uh, I believe it was in New Orleans. Um, in 1960. So Ruby Bridges is only 68 years old. So uh, this is an ancient history. Um, lots of black children, you know, children, teenagers played a large role in the civil rights movement, uh, marching, protesting. And I think one of the galvanizing moments of the civil rights movement was the television um, broadcast of, you know, children being sprayed with water hoses, uh, being attacked by dogs. Just so you guys know, uh, those water hoses, the pressure is strong enough to take the bark uh, off of trees. So um, it's not a, not a day at the water park. Um, and here in this book, we have children or high school students uh, who are the ones being brave. And with the recent book, brand, book bans we're seeing across the country, I think it is, is doing such a disservice to youth nowadays to be robbed of these stories and accounts, um, biographies of other people or, you know, children or people who, when they were children, um, you know, were activists and were fighting for their civil rights and the civil rights of others. Um, so I just wanted to read the group uh, a couple stats on book banning recently. So uh, this is since the end of 2019. Over 1,500 book bans have occurred in at least 86 school districts in 26 states uh, in the United States. Of the total number of books banned, 41% included protagonists or prominent secondary characters who are people of color. 33% included protagonists or prominent secondary characters who are members of the LGBTQ community. 22% of the titles directly address issues of race and racism. 16% of the books are history or biographies. 9% have themes related uh, to, act, to rights or activism. Um, the state of Florida is getting the most attention since their governor has made banning, uh, banning these type of books kind of one of the selling points for his presidential run. Um, his bill is called the Stop Woke Act, which it says seeks to restrict how conversations about race and gender take place in schools and in workplaces by barring any discussion that would make people feel guilty or uncomfortable about past wrongs. Um, it says it also prohibits instruction on race relations or diversity that imply a person's status as either privileged or oppressed is necessarily determined by his or her race. Um, the law is pretty vague, which many people believe is intentional, and the penalties are steep for educators uh, who could be terminated if they are found to violate that law. And so my question is, um, have any teachers introduced your book into their classrooms? Have you heard from any teachers that there is resistance from their administration um, for teaching your book or any kind of books uh, that are similar? And kind of what do you see as the long-term ramifications of, of these book bans? Yeah, you know, in, in 2020, when my book came out uh, and the, the book bans um, really started to, to rise and um, I would say book bans and challenges because really what's happening more is that there are more challenges and actually bans happening. And when the challenges occur, you actually are finding that schools are just schools and libraries are just quietly pulling books because they don't want there to be an issue. And that to me is even worse because it's not even visible. It's sort of quietly um, happening in that way. But um, so, you know, for 2020, when my book came out, I used to joke with 
folks, because people would ask me like, oh, is your book, you know, banned? That would be really great. And I'm like, actually, no, that's a, that's actually a bad thing. Um, they're, you know, um, and they, they see, you know, that there's some books that, that you probably have seen on Good Morning in America that have been banned and then all these people rally, but that's like a handful of books. Really, it, it hurts kids because kids are the ones that actually can't access the books on their own, oftentimes, um, especially the ones that you're really trying to reach. And so that's who it really hurts. Um, and, and, you know, my answer when I joke was that the reality is, is that the, you know, the people who are, you know, going against particular books, they're not actually reading them. And they're actually not readers. And they're likely not even educators. Um, and so, you know, there, there are people who um, there's a lot of advocacy that's going on. It's like it's basically it's lobbying that's occurring. Um, and there, you know, people are given talking points and lists. And, you know, it's it's very targeted with what's happening. And um, what I joked about was that because my title said America in it, I'm like, they didn't even like go deep. They're like, oh, yeah, you know, it's America. Right. America, America, make America great, you know. Um, and so that, that my book was really, you know, untouched. Um, and then it really, uh, someone asked me to do a panel about um, book banning and other kinds of things. And I was like, you know, I haven't heard anything about me. Let me, you know, Google, you know, to see if there's anything. And I realized my book was actually being challenged and banned. And I, I had no idea that this was happening. And then shortly after I started to be tagged in social media, um, you know, for my, my book um, being in that way. And it's such an interesting dichotomy because um my book has been recognized by states. So like, so there's all these, um, your state will have like teens vote about like the books that they loved and, and you'll get like this message of like, you're the top 10 or whatever and the state, you know, supports your book and is putting in the schools. And, and I would have that at the same time in a county that my book was being banned. And so you have these teens who are loving this book in the same place that, um, you know, folks are sort of banning and challenging. And, um, you know, a lot of writers are, you know, we can't focus on being banned. Um, we have to keep writing mm -hmm. um, and and just keep doing that. And you know, my big screw you that I, that I did for that is the first place that I was banned is a, a place in um, Bucks County, Pennsylvania. And I've been writing a historical fiction set in Levittown, which um, for those of you that aren't familiar, Levitt and Sons was sort of the first company that brought suburban America like row house development. Like they were the first to do it. Um, they also would not sell to anyone who was not white. Um, and so those were the white flight communities set in the 1940s and 50s. And Levittown was based in Long Island, New York, and Pennsylvania. Um, and I had been toggling about where do I want to write my story? Do I, Long Island is so interesting. But then when I started getting these, um, tagging all these messages about this, this fight that was happening about my book in Bucks County, mm -hmm. um, and I, I looked at Bucks County and I'm like, wow, Levittown is in Bucks County. So my next novel that's coming out in 2024, I'm setting it in that community. And that's, my, that, that's how I write. Um, you want to understand about why this is happening now. You have to look at what is happening in the community and your history um, that's there. Um, and a lot of it, it's, it's like everything else is political. It's just politicized. It's just another way to sort of fight a battle, um, add a battle. Um, you know, the fact that, you know, there's debates about, you know, well, you can teach Rosa Parks, but you can't say Rosa Parks is Black. You know, things like that that are like real things that are happening. Um, it's gross. <laughs> um, and, and it's sort of the reality of the temperament. And I think the, the challenge with the book bannings is that we're often, I think, on the defense of that and, and educators, they're on the front lines that they, they have to do that. And, and I have had in Colorado, there's a librarian who um, had a book club called Woke Read, um, who had my book and other books. Um, and I did an event with them um, and she was fired, um, because, not because of my particular event, but because she had this Woke Read thing happening. And, and that is the reality of like the challenges that occur because you know, when it comes down to, will you be fired? Will you lose your job? You know, um, unless the whole, you know, country comes together and, um, you know, you know, says we're not going to teach unless you do that, which I think actually you should do that for um, 
our gun laws and um, and for um, uh, messing with the curriculum, like that's actually like a very powerful way to make change. But I didn't say that loud as an administrator of a university that we should go on strike for. Right, right. <laughs> I, just, I, did, I didn't say that at all. Nice. <laughs> Um, well, I wanted to open up the floor for anyone here who had questions, or I don't know if anyone uh, attending virtually has submitted questions. Oh, yes. Uh, so I'm from Arizona, which um, you know I think was probably one of the trailblazers uh, of like this new wave of book banning and restriction of curriculum going back to like the 2000s, and you know we've seen where this has gone the last 15, 20 years. Um, it's gotten worse. So I guess what gives you hope or optimism that you know things will improve or that this you know trend will recede sometime in the future? Yeah, I mean, I, I think what gives me hope is this current generation that seem to me to be really they uh, you know they're they seem to be unstoppable. <laughs> um, they they're utilizing social media and other avenues in a lot of different ways. Um, there's tons of groundwork that's happening. Um, that's why you see a lot of like questions about, you know, what age should you vote? So some states are looking at like, should you really be 18? Like, should you be 21? Is And it's because of this new generation is more active than they have been in a very long time. And so to me, that actually gives me hope. What also gives me hope is the reality is that we are diversifying and, and it's not just about race. It's about all identities and the intersection of identities of like, I will no longer be silenced and um, the bias and the sort of lack of um, recognition of the, the beauty of our own diversity that, that we have is that the younger generation, they get it. Like you can teach a, a four-year-old pronouns like mm -hmm. it's not complicated. It's not rocket science. Um, like in their classes, they're ha they're having these conversations. They're getting it. And I think to me, that's what gives me hope is that you know us and old me, I'll claim it, me and older, <laughs> we might not know how to do it or how to organize. We're too busy trying to pay our mortgages that we're not willing to to you know sacrifice certain things. But you know these young folks to me really, really are. Um, what scares me about all that's happening is that we do have all of this technology and there's a, there is a fight for knowledge and power. And if we look at AI, for example, and the influence of, you know, um, you know, how the internet came online and how you can, you know, find lots of information. If you Google it, it's like, who is going to be fueling and informing, informing AI and how, how are we going to actually have understanding of that? Because if we're trying to police certain things, and then we have this sort of new technology that I think young people are going to be rapid fire. They want it. Like we're all scared for it. It's like, oh no, they're going to, they're going to cheat on their papers. You know, and the young people are like, oh, access to information. Um, that part scares me. And can we, you know, can we move that needle in terms of the access to information? Um, and, and that I think is that part of the biggest challenge. Quick question, just because I'm controlling the mic. Um, I uh, thank you for being here. I did not read the book. Uh, I have to preface by saying that. But um, what you said specifically in terms of um, slavery hasn't ended, it's just evolved, right? You know, with mass incarceration, with the drug war, which is specifically the question that I want to ask you. Before I worked here, I worked with an organization called the Drug Policy Alliance, which is based up in New York. And it's an organization that is essentially trying to end the war on drugs, um, dealing with the war on drugs through talking about criminal justice reform, mass incarceration, the disparities in terms of who's arrested for what. Uh, so I'm curious, through my time there, um, I, obviously the disparities that are happening in terms of who is arrested for, for what drug offenses is fueling mass incarceration, the drug war is fueling mass incarceration. How, how much do you think that needs to be a focus? And it might be something that you talk about in the book again, as I said, I didn't read it, but how much do you think that plays into sort of the continuation of essentially slavery, which is mass incarceration as we know it. Yeah, I mean, I, um, thank you. Thank you for that. And um, that sounds like an amazing organization um, that you worked at. Um, it's a lot of different factors, you know, and you know, there, there's, there are changes that are occurring right now with this issue of, of drugs and people actually seeing it as a mental health issue. And, and mostly it's because now 
white communities are being impacted by the opi it's, it's an opioid crisis now. Right, it's not like crack on the street, right? You know, it's not, it's like the, the the language is really really different. Um, but we when we think about the impact of guns being bought into communities, drugs being bought into communities, lack of resources, lack of investment, like you see what that actually can happen to a community that then sort of creates this environment where you're then feeding the system, right? The, the prison, you know, industrial complex, you're sort of feeding this system. And so there's pieces of that. My book doesn't doesn't touch on um, sort of related to the, to the drug war. It, my book really kind of focuses on um, generational implications um, and, and systems that people are operating. So, you know, in the story, it's about, um, you know, Tracy's father never stood a chance. You know, he it was just assumed it was just given like, you know, the media hits people want to feel resolved in the community, which is, I think, what we see every day. You see something on the news, you see something on social media, you quickly become a person, uh, uh, you know, uh, an opinion of something, you know, um, representatives have pressure, you know, police have pressure, district attorneys have pressure, the, the resolve, resolve, resolve. And so it sort of creates this sort of you know, system that's rewarded actually to like have quicker responses. And, and so my story kind of deals with the generational aspect of, um, you know, that um, people who are in, people who are incarcerated at some point in their life, their children are three times more likely to be incarcerated. And so that, so my story sort of deals with this sort of generational implication of if you have injustice occurring, that then affects the future and the community, then it sort of is perpetuating this cycle um, that we really sort of need to address. So. Mm -hmm. Hi, thanks for coming. Uh, I have two questions that are more about the writing process, if that's all right. So the first is, what did you find to be the hardest part about writing? Was it dialogue? Was it the bigger ideas? Was it all of that? Then the second question is more about the characters. So they're, they're always, you know, the good guys and the bad guys. And it's easy to love the good guys. And it's easy to write. It's easier to write the characters you love. How do you write the characters you dislike without, because everything's so politicized, without like just really making them hateful? How do you do that? Yeah, yeah, really good question. And I, and I think it's like a learning process. Um, that you, as a writer, you just sort of keep going and you honing in and trying to figure it out. But like when I have a story, usually I'm struck by inspiration. And I, you know, I think of myself as a slightly different writer in that I feel like I'm I'm bearing witness. Like James Baldwin is a huge influence of mine in terms of like his work and life and um and and how he approached his writing. And he always talked about like bearing witness. And and I feel like a lot of the things that strike me are things that then I become incredibly passionate about. And so it pours out of me. And usually it's like kind of garbage, honestly, like, like if, if any writers, like if you're going to be on it, like you're just, you're just getting it out there. And I you talk about writing, like it's, you're building a sandcastle. Like it's not a sandcastle when it starts, it's, there's just sand on the beach and you're trying to figure out like what sand you want to use, what containers to sort of put it in. How do you want to construct it and going over it and over it. And, um, and so that's how I kind of start is like, I start, my idea. And if I feel like it's a really great idea, I'll just keep writing. I don't care about chapters. I don't like, you know, with this novel, I wrote a scene that was like kind of at the end first, because that's what sort of came to me. And then it was like sort of stepping back of like, wow, how did it get here? And then sort of building from that. Um, for me, characterization is really important, especially with what I was trying to write, because it's, it was too easy to be like, that's the bad guy. This is the, like, that was you know, that simplifies an actually really nuanced world. What is bad? What is good? What, you know, what, what exactly is that? And, and I have very obvious elements in my story. Like it's set in Texas. Um, I wanted to write a novel that you could read it and you'd be like, was this set in 1970? Was it set in 1990? Was it set? When, when was this set? Um, and I really wanted to write in that way because it just seems like things just slightly change, but they're still the same. The past is the present, the present is the past. And um, so I have very obvious things. Like, so I, I do have a moment where there is a history of the KKK in my story, but that's actually not the core of the story. That's like, that's like one element within that shows like, this is the obvious 
the boogeyman, right? This is like the one that we always try to say, well, you know, it wasn't racist because I'm not, you know, I'm not, you know, wearing my white, you know, whatever. Um, and and how do you actually create characters? And I do have actually quite a few characters that have that big aha moment that decisions that they made actually really impacted people's lives. And so you're sort of balancing understanding where they're coming from, but hating every moment of where they're coming from. And, and I think that that's, not, that's more real than anything to write those characters in that way. Um, and then when you're writing the characters that you're like, you really dislike, like, you know, like you're like the obvious, you know, um, it's cathartic, you know, <laughs> you know, like you give them, you know, you give them, um, you have a sort of persona that you're sort of going for, but not having it be so like nefarious that it doesn't feel like a real character. Like it's, the minute it becomes cartoonish and that like takes away from, from the story that you're trying to write. But, um, and I learned through it by reading a lot and like television and movies and, you know, um, all of that, like help feed thinking about like watching something and seeing and breaking it down. Like, you know, like the ways in which, you know, I did like something or like, wow, you know, I wish that they would have done something different. And, and that's actually how I started writing was realizing that I broke down plots of what I was watching. And I typically would find out who the bad guy or like, oh yeah, like 10 minutes in, oh yeah, it's totally that person. I realized that like my brain was working in a different kind of way. And I think that has helped me a lot with character. Nice. I think we probably have time for one more. I don't know if anyone submitted a question online, but uh, if not, I, we can, okay. I have two more questions as we wind this down. I'll be um, brief. I'll be brief. I promise. <laughs> was there a particular uh, passage from the book that is your is your favorite passage? Yeah, um, there's one line, and then I'll read a very brief. I'm not going to read a long time. Don't worry. Um, one of my favorite lines that I think is really relevant to today um, is um, Tracy talking with you know her family and you know saying that. Um, a white guy with an AK-47 has more rights than a black kid with Skittles. Like, um, I remember that. Um, you know, that's one of my sort of favorite, you know, one, one-liners. Um, another a very brief passage that I'll just read um, is, I started doing a lot of research and I did all these books, I read all these books and had all these like, historical things and I'm like, oh, I can't have the book burden with that. And so I was able to, um, in this scene, take everything that I read and put it in this scene and which is like been a waste because I spent like like hours and then it was just like this moment but um so this is like Jamal which is Tracy's brother um and I'm talking a lot (laughs) this is Jamal talking who um then he's accused of killing a local white girl in the community and he he goes on the run so that's kind of like his storyline in the story and so he's talking Jamal's voice is cracking, desperate words that have been suffocating him. 400 years and we still ain't American to them, T. All that blood, we built America. Black labor built the greatest nation in the world for free. They ripped us from our family then and they do it again with new laws, disguises change. I'll be in prison doing that labor for free. And it, it, I don't want to read, I don't want to take up too much time, but like that sort of like example of um, just like taking a ton of history and realizing the reader is a teen and you're not going to, you're not going to like, teach them all this history, but you can sort of give them a flavor of like the core of the issues. So great, great. I know you mentioned that uh, your new book, Invisible Sun, is coming out uh, this summer. Uh, If you would mind, could you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, so um, I I love Ralph Ellison, L. Ellison and Richard Wright. And they were the, the, some of the first early reads that I read, so Native Son and Invisible Man. And when I was writing my novel, yeah, which is about a 17-year-old Black boy dealing with being also wrongfully accused of um, something, so doing it as a teen, so he spends time in juvenile justice system. And he returns February 2020, right before the pandemic starts in Portland, Oregon, um, and he is then set in isolation and, um, and trying to figure out how can he free his name? Um, how can he do it during the pandemic in this really scary way that no one knew what was happening in the pandemic? And set in um, Portland, Oregon, that has a long history 
um, of exclusion, black exclusion in the community. And so it deals with a lot of issues and it was kind of co come closer to home um, because I didn't get a chance to, um, to, to write about, you know, the community that I know closely because um, my first novel was set in Texas. And so, yeah, I'm excited about that. It has similar themes, but it's told in a different way and a different kind of protagonist who isn't as like, He's not an activist like Tracy is in this story. He actually just kind of wants to like get on with his life and he wants to deal with all these things, but the pandemic is happening. And then all of a sudden there's people protesting and people want him to care about protesting. And he's like, I want people to care about me. I don't want to care about protesting. And so, um, yeah, I'm really, I'm nervous and excited <laughs> um, for the release of that. I am excited to read it. Uh, so we are coming up on an hour. So we're going to go ahead and wrap things up. Uh, just like to say thank you so much. Uh, thank you to the diversity, equity, and inclusion team for hosting this event. Um, thank you for everyone here in person and for all of you attending online. Uh, be sure to check out the book, This Is My America, available on Amazon, also available uh, if you're like me and like audiobooks on Audible. Uh, it's received great reviews, um, so be sure to check it out. Thank you so much. Have a good night.